So welcome everyone to the Humanity Student Talk of the Six Polygen Symposium of Rising Scholars. My name is Isabella. Um, I did my undergrad at Tufts and I'm headed to UCSD for graduate school in the fall. Um, and I'll be moderating today's talk. So the goal of the symposium is to celebrate and showcase the hard work of our Polygen scholars, all of whom have worked tirelessly on their projects over the past couple of months. So we have two, potentially three student presenters um, presenting on a variety of topics today and a fellow Polygen's mentor will be scoring each of the students presentations, which will help us determine prize winners after the event. Um, and if there are any questions, you can type them in the chat uh, and we'll allot around two minutes per presenter, maybe a little bit more since we only have two students right now. Um, so today's speakers are um, Chris Schwarma and Tridib Chakraborty. And we will begin with um, Chris. So you can go ahead and share your screen. All right. Um, all right. Hello, my name is Chris Sharma. I am a sophomore from Brookfield Academy in Brookfield, Wisconsin. And I did my research about the topic of transitioning Romanitas and inscriptions of the post-Roman world. So first, let's take a look at what some of these words in, in this uh, topic actually mean. So first, let's talk about define, defining Romanitas. Romanitas is the ancient Roman social, political, and cultural practice. Essentially, it's how the Romans were and the way that they functioned and the kind of things that they did. Some scholars say that it is kind of like a Romanness or kind of the identity that was acknowledged with the Romans during their time. So my entire goal of my research was to examine what happened to this Romanness or Romanitas after the Romans fell, after they were conquered in 476 AD. So to do this, my main source was inscriptions. And one of them, my biggest sources was something called the CIL, which is the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum. So the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum is basically a collection of inscriptions from the time of the Roman Empire. And it's arranged in uh, books by geographic region. And when they were first creating this corpus or like body of Latin inscriptions, they had to decide when they were going to end the purely Roman inscriptions, whether that date of 476 AD was the proper ending date for a Roman, purely Roman inscription. So here they actually made the decision to say that Roman inscriptions do not end at 476 AD, which was a very, very interesting thing that I thought signified that maybe Romanitas uh, existed even after they fell in 476 AD. So let's think about why I use inscriptions. So the reason why I use inscriptions is because I feel like they're the most historically preserved out of all of the sources, um, especially for classical, like ancient Roman and ancient Greek times. It captures like the exact thinking of the time period and it's pieces of real language. Nothing is really lost in translation or anything. So first, when we have to think about uh, the topic, we want to first examine what happened before the fall of Rome so we can compare it to what happened and what sort of things were going on after the fall. So before the fall of Rome, Rome existed as the dominant power in the entire in, in all of Europe. They controlled all the way from the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain and Portugal, to colonies in the Middle East like Syria and so and such. So basically, it had control of most of Europe and was a very, very dominant power. So first, let's begin by looking at one of my first inscriptions that I talked about. And this is the statue base of Licinius. So this statue base was located in Tarragona, which is a city in Spain. And it, it essentially is a statue of the Roman emperor Licinius, who is an emperor who ruled during the fourth century AD. So the, this, this inscription is located at the base of the statue. So whenever a visitor or anybody was looking at the statue, this was the description that they read. So this uh, inscription is important because it kind of gives an insight onto how the Roman emperors were viewed at the time before, uh, before the fall of the, of the Roman Empire itself. So one big thing that we see in this inscription is the use of titles. So... T titles that are attributed to the emperor, like Kinius. 
So one of them is conqueror of all barbarian people. Uh, another one is like most provident of all former emperors. And we see that this is important because it shows that not only is Rome strong, but it's also conquering other people, right? And then also we see pious, lucky, unconquered Augustus as a description of Lycanus. And again, we see this idea of conquering and being able to uh, subdue other people. So we see this establishment of Rome as a very, very solid and dominant power. Another, uh, some other titles that are attributed to Lycanus are Pontifex Maximus and Pater Patriae, which are very important uh, titles throughout uh, Roman history and date back all the way to the beginning of ancient Rome. One of them, Pater Patriae, means father of the fatherland. So this title is essentially a heroic title given to um, someone who does a heroic deed. So famous people like Caesar, Julius Caesar, who was um, one of the most prominent figures in Roman history, and Cicero, who was a very, very famous orator. People like, the, people like them have this uh, title of pater patriae, and it's kind of a, a big honor. So this, this title being attributed to Lycinius is, is quite significant. So some other inscriptions that I looked at were in the form of coins. One coin in particular was this coin called the Siliqua. So the Siliqua is 1 24th of a regular gold solidus. So it's similar to our modern day penny. It's not a coin that has much value, but it is a coin that is circulated widely. So this is important because many, many people in ancient Rome and in their empire would have seen this coin. So this coin contained many important symbols like the Orbs Roma and, and the symbol of victory. So the Orbs Roma was basically a symbol of the city of Rome. And again, we see this symbol of Rome as like the dominant strong power uh, within the empire. And then also we see uh, the, idea of, the idea of victory, the idea of conquering and uh, the Roman goddess uh, Nike. And uh, it symbolized Rome as victorious and dominant, right? So this idea was reinforced even on their coins that would be circulated in their daily lives. So another tribe that was very important near the end of, of uh, Rome's empire was the Gothic tribe, the Visigoths. So they sacked Rome actually in 410. And this certain siliqua that you see on, on the screen was actually found in Gaul. Um, it was found in Gaul uh, in, in the territory of the Visigoths. So this, this coin was actually seen by the people of Visigoths. And it, and it actually is almost identical to the coin that we see over here. So they're almost the same. Um, even though they, it was still in different territories. So this kind of shows how, how Rome had that power, even in places that weren't necessarily controlled fully by Romans. So now let's talk about what happened after the fall. So let's see if we can see any continuity or discontinuity in these ideas um, before and end, before and after the fall of the Roman Empire. So one of the first... Um, inscriptions that I came across was the uh, inscription of the Ostr Ostrogoth king Theodoric. And the Ostrogoths were basically a tribe that controlled a lot of central Italy during the 5th century AD. So the 5th century AD is right after the uh, fall of the Roman Empire. And the Ostrogoths' most famous powerful ruler was Theodoric. And this inscription particularly deals with a specific subject, but it begins by giving these titles, which we saw already, in an inscription um, of Licinius, giving these very, very similar titles to Theodoric. So these titles include like Inclitus, which basically means famous, Victor Ac Triumphator, which means victorious, as we saw earlier with the idea of being victorious and conquering, Domitor Gentium, which basically means conquered, conqueror of all foreign, foreign people. So that's almost the exact same as what we saw in the inscription of Licinius. And a very interesting one here is the propagator of Romani uh, nomis, nominus. So that basically means propagator of the Roman name. So it kind of shows how he's continuing this idea of being Roman and that idea of being victorious and truly Roman. So this uh, inscription was actually uh, was mentioned by 
a uh, very famous literary figure who is Cassiodorus, who was a personal secretary of Theodoric. And he wrote um, a lot of letters in his uh, literary work, Varii. And he's a very famous author that we get a lot of information about Theodoric from. So this inscription talked about uh, Basilius Decius and the draining of the marsh. So this was also significant because it kind of showed a little thing that they were doing during the time um, after a little project that they were doing after the uh, fall of the Roman Empire. And they a specific uh, prefect or basically an officer of the government um, was working on, on draining this marsh. And this marsh actually hadn't been drained all the way since the beginning of, of, the, of the Roman um, Republic. So it, it kind of showed how Theodoric was kind of improving on what the Romans had done before. Okay, let's talk about another one of the inscriptions that I came across, which was Liberius's epitaph. And this uh, was an epitaph. So an epitaph basically commemorates the legacy of a dead person, right? So it gives insight onto how the, the person was viewed when they were living. Liberius, he was a very famous patrician. Uh, he, patrician, a patrician, basically a person who is wealthy in Rome and has very high status. So he was very well-traveled. He held office, offices in Italy, Gaul, and Egypt, which is on like very different sides of the Roman Empire. So he was well-traveled and had a lot of experience. So within this um, inscription, we see a very specific um, mention of this cultural practice of the Romans called the tumulus. So the tumulus was basically a mound of of dirt, almost like a little hill, uh, as you can see in the picture, that the Romans basically piled on top of uh, the dead that were buried underneath. So this kind of shows that even after the fall of Rome, we still see these cultural practices and these things that are very, very Roman that are still being used. Okay, uh, another important thing about this epitaph is that the meter of the actual epitaph is elegiac couplet, which is a very, very Roman and very, very famous meter that was used by many poets like Ovid and Catullus. And it's very significant because this meter is really, really hinting back at the idea of being very, very Roman. And it shows that even though the Roman, the Roman people aren't in control, it still shows of their impact and their presence in the times of the Ostrogoths. Okay, one last inscription that I thought was very, very interesting was the Contiorix inscription. So this inscription was actually found in Britain. So unlike most of the things that we talked about today, this inscription was very, very far out. It was still part of, Britain was still part of the Roman Empire, but it is on the verge of the Roman Empire. So it's very, very far out. So it's very interesting to see how even after the fall in such a far place from Italy, how there's still very, very Roman ideas and there's an impact all the way in Britain. So the Contiorix stone marker basically says, um, it says that, that, uh, that a, a, a citizen named Venendotius uh, was here and it mentions how, um, and uses the words kiwis and magistratus. So these two words are very significant and these two words of kiwis and magis there are very, very Roman ideas. So kiwis is basically the Roman idea of a citizen. So during the empire, citizenship played a very, very important role in the success of Rome because after they conquered a certain people, they would usually give them citizenship. And that's how they were able to build up such a very big and strong and wide emperor, uh, empire. So the idea of kiwis really shows that that most of the things that are happening in fifth century Britain are still related to the Roman political practices. Also, the idea of magister, uh, which is an important word that means teacher or master, kind of symbolizes that Roman authority that we saw earlier. Okay, so in conclusion, from these inscriptions, before and after the fall of the empire, we can see that there is continuity and discontinuity. We see continuity in the use of Roman vocabulary. We see the Roman cultural practices like the tumulus, and we see the use of a lot of Roman titles that are attributed to many people after the fall of their empire. But we also see a lot of discontinuity. 
there's a change in religion, like Christianity is introduced um, and it becomes much, much more prominent it becomes a primary religion after the fall and even a little bit before the fall of, of Rome. There's also less Roman control. So more ideas that are less Roman and more less Roman rulers are in control. And there's a loss of Roman authority. Now the Romans don't really have all the authority people like Theodoric and other people who still might carry on their name, but they still don't have the authority anymore. So thank you for listening to my uh, talk. This is my work cited and thank you. Great, um, we have a question that was already in the chat, um, which was what were the literacy rates like then back in the day? Um, and would it be fair to say that Romanatos is an idea and an aesthetic that's mostly reinforced around like the literate populations and how might this have manifested among like illiterate populations? Yeah, so so that's a that's a very good question. So the literacy rate back in those days was quite low. Um, I think that it is very fair to say that the Rom Romanatos is a very like um, it's more of an idea that was kind of created by scholars just looking back at the time. They weren't really like, it's not something that really had a super big effect on the actual actions, I think. It's just an observ kind of like an observation that scholars really made um, about kind of trends that happened before, like basically throughout uh, the Roman Empire. So I think, yeah, it's fair to say that it's more of a uh, like aesthetic, as you said. Super cool. Thanks for, thanks for your answer. Thank you. Great. So I think we'll move on to our next panelist. So um, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and we can get started. Cool. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. OK, cool. Hi, my name is Om Shah, and I go to the Lakeside School in Seattle, Washington. And my research is about a novel machine learning approach for predicting poverty with temperature and satellite imagery. I came across this research when I was looking at different causes of poverty. I came across food insecurity, migration, and even climate change, but another issue struck me even more. The fact that there wasn't enough poverty data to make reliable assumptions from organizations and leaders on the state of poverty throughout the world, and I sought to change this issue. So the impact of lacking poverty data is very high, especially in developing countries. With a lack of poverty data, we have unaddressed humanitarian crises where organizations cannot deliver critical resources to impoverished areas. We also have a breakdown of health, public health services where medical associations aren't able to get, provide disease equipment to areas in need where those areas can include poverty. And we saw this especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And poverty also forces communities and families to rely more and more on the um, more and more on the natural resources around them, which causes environmental degradation. So currently, the currently the only day to the current way to process poverty is through demographic surveys, and these are time consuming and they're also very expensive. And this means that a lot of these developing countries can't process these poverty ratios and rates at a sustainable rate. And this means that these poverty surveys are only conducted once every decade, which is not enough time for organizations to make assumptions on poverty. So there's a very real time poverty data need to reliably serve communities from falling into the cycle of poverty, but also dismantling existing cycles of poverty. So here in this map, we can see that the current poverty data throughout the world uh, is very high in places such as South America and the Western world, where there's the resources and funds to produce poverty rates. But in places such as Africa and South Asia, there's not enough funds and resources. And we see that in the sense where we only have one or two surveys, demographic surveys per decade. So previous work by Stanford's Airmon Lab has showed that machine learning and highly correlated variables with poverty can be good predictors of poverty. So from this, we can say that correlated variables, maybe food insecurity or migration can predict poverty. And also machine learning allows for real-time poverty prediction at a very efficient rate. So my research goal was to predict poverty accurately using a novel machine learning method. And the engineering criteria that I went with was to 
use a real-time poverty prediction method, something that I could spin up in a matter of hours or even days, and a reliable implementation that could be used anywhere at any time. So I, choose, I chose for climate change to be my variable to predict poverty because of the direct links between climate change and poverty. As seen in, in the map in the right, poverty, climate change increases poverty by anywhere between one to 10% globally. And this is because climate change drastically reduces crop harvest. When you have higher temperatures, you have less crop harvest. And for communities whose only form of sustenance is crops, that's, uh, that's not very good. And climate change also evaporates very critical water sources. And this forces communities to migrate, which increases regional poverty rates. We can quantify climate change with the change in temperature variable. So this change in temperature variable or delta can be used as a proxy for poverty because we know climate change can model poverty. We can also visualize climate change with satellite imagery to spatially relate geographic poverty rates with climate change. A bonus of both of, of, both of the temp change in temperature variables and the satellite imagery is that it's available in high resolution and it's very abundant. We can get these values anywhere from 1980 to the present day. And to measure poverty, we use consumption. Consumption per capita is a numeric measure of how much an individual participates in their local and global economy. It, it's, it's a measure of the total consumption of goods and services. So in all, we take all these variables to use a machine learning model based on temperature data and satellite images to predict consumption in Ethiopia. And we chose Ethiopia because number one, there's less poverty data in that region. It's highly affected by climate change. And also it's a good way to see how our model performs on a small basis. I used four different data sets and I used an array of software tools to carry out my research. I used WorldClim, a temperature data resource to look at one kilometer by one kilometer temperature values at Celsius. And I looked at the change in temperature between 1980 and 2016 for Ethiopia. And we'll get to why I used 2016 later. For the satellite imagery, I used a Google Maps static API service at a 16 factor zoom resolution and I downloaded over 25,000 images of Ethiopia. I got my consumption data from the World Bank's living measurement study. From this study, I got the consumption per capita for Ethiopia at tw during 2016. This is why I found the temperature data for 2016 in Ethiopia. And it also gave us 500 survey locations to see where oh, and what images we should download. We also used two ground truth variables that have proven links to poverty to check our temperature model against. And these ground truth variables, vegetation cover and population count, were derived from the Google Earth Engine platform. For my software tools, I used a Google Cloud virtual machine to run all of my programming scripts on. I used a Jupyter Notebook, which is a programming environment specifically geared for machine learning and data science to run my code in. My code is written in Python, and I use the TensorFlow, Keras, NumPy, Pandas, PyTorch, and Matplotlib machine learning and data science libraries. For, I had three parts for my methods. There was a data and pre-processing part, a model training part, and an output part. I took 25,000 images, their respective change in temperature values and consumption per capita values, and I pre-processed these and binned these. By pre-processing, I grouped all of these images into 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer clusters, and I binned all the temperature values into three different ranges. Then a convolutional neural network or an Im image processor used based on machine learning predicts temperature from satellite images. Then we look at these temperature predictions and find the most useful predictions. A lot of time the CNN can produce predictions that aren't really necessary for the end goal. So we wanna remove these using feature extraction. And finally, we use a ridge regression, a type of linear regression to correlate our temperature predictions into poverty predictions. We check the performance of our model using a five-fold cross-validation. And this five-fold cross-validation model provides an R-squared metric, which gives us the amount of the independent or dependent variable, which is consumption per capita that can be explained by our independent variable, in this case, temperature or the temperature predictions from the CNN. So let's dive into our data pre-processing framework. I use data aggregation to integrate spatial awareness into the model. I didn't want to look at too small an image, like a one kilometer by one kilometer image, but I didn't want to look at too big because we already have that information. So I aggregated all the data into 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer clusters. 
This means that each cluster had about 100 satellite images and the respective data points for each cluster. I also used temperature binning with the Gaussian mixture model to reduce temperature anomalies. Small anomalies cannot contribute towards the overall trend of temperature versus consumption per capita. So I wanted to remove these anomalies. So the temperature was binned into three bins. There are distinct ranges found in the temperature data set. Before I fed the satellite images into the CNN, I used something called image augmentation. Image augmentation flips, rotates, and color grades the satellite images so that we can increase the amount of training data for this machine learning model without having to find more satellite images. This is a great way to increase the accuracy of our model. And for our model training and output framework, that we used a combination of four different neural network models and a single R-squared metric. The, the convolutional neural network predicted the temperature from each satellite image. The feature extraction model found the most important features, and the ridge regression model used linear regression to correlate our independent variable with our dependent variable for the most accuracy for prediction tasks. We use a cross-validation model to test the performance of our model, and we use uh, the final metric, the R-squared metric, to show the correlation between independent and dependent variable. So what were our findings? We found that the temperature model had an R-squared score of 20%. This is really high. And we also found that the ground truth models had an R squared of the vegetation model had an R squared score of 4%, and the population model had an R squared score of 5%. We also were able to map out the regional trends of poverty from the machine learning model and the actual values. And we can see these on the left and right. So, in conclusion, we can see that our R squared score of 20% is very high for predicting human variables, for example, consumption. And the results also exceeded the ground truth model. 20% versus 4 and 5% respectively. So we were able to see, uh, satisfy our engineering goals by providing accurate spatial poverty rates and create a temperature model that works in real time. We can use data from yesterday. And we were able to predict poverty in less than 0.015% of a decade, which is a normal turnaround time for surveys. So there are some caveats in our model. Large scale temperature anomalies, such as what happened during the pandemic, can affect the model. And we also assume a consumption-based economy where agrarian economies don't really factor into our model. So our future research would expand into other countries to check our accuracy in other parts of the world and add more variables to augment our model past just climate change. Here are my references and thank you very much. Great job. So we have um, a question in the chat, which was um, why 1980 is the starting date of your analysis? Yeah, so I used 1980 because um, not between, so climate change was a phenomenon that's been forever, right? We've seen ups and downs, but human induced climate change has started around 1950s and 1960s, but we really start seeing an exponential rise at around 1980. So that's why I used 1980. And also that's the most recent temperature data that we have. Great, and then we have another question, which was, can you say more about why climate change affects low-income areas more than high-income areas and how um, it might increase poverty? Yeah, so climate change is a unique variable because it's very recent and it's very much human-induced. So climate change impacts um, underdeveloped areas more because it forces them to remove themselves from their agrarian economies, which is usually what developing communities use to pro provide sustenance. So when the climate change increases, we see a sharp decrease of profits from crop harvest, which increases their risk of poverty or it increases how much of a poverty status they're in right now. Very helpful, thank you. Great, so I don't see any other questions, so great job. And we'll have our last um, presenter. So Trudib, if you wanna share your screen, um, we can get started. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yep, looks great. Okay, so my research was a literature review about California forests and the growing wildfire and how they're increasing the devastation in the area and what we can do about it. Uh, I'm from Troy High School in Troy, Michigan. So today I'm gonna to start by talking a little bit about an introduction, a little bit about why this is important and why should we focus on it. 
I'm gonna to touch upon the fact of positive feedback loops as that was a system that I tried to trickle in in every type of subject to give a little bit of an advance notice for everyone to why this is an important feature to look at. I'm gonna talk about the drivers, which are the causes, the climate change and human causes, as well as the impacts on biodiversity and the terrain. Finally, I'm gonna finish up with some solutions. However, I do mention that these are not all the solutions. These are just the ones that I found that proved to be the most effective and have the most potential for the future. So let's start by why is this important? So in 2020 alone, over 4 million acres were burned in California. Now to give you some uh, idea of how big this is, the area that is burned is almost covering the states of Washington and Oregon, which is incredible. And it's 3 million more than the average than the last five years. And it's growing at an exponential rate. They're spiraling out of control for many reasons and they're destroying habitats left and right. If properly not addressed now, these wildfires could wipe out the California forest ecosystem, which is one of the greatest ecosystems in the US when it comes to species richness and diversity. Now, um, positive feedback loops is a bit of a new topic for many. Um, they talk about how a system can amplify its effects over time and not return to homeostasis. If you look on the right side of the picture, you're gonna see a negative feedback versus a positive feedback. A negative feedback loop is used in an environment to make sure that things return to homeostasis. However, positive feedbacks, instead of returning, amplify the effects. And this will be shown in the global warming on the left side here. We'll talk more about this in the driver section. So what are the drivers of wildfires? So the big one I wanted to focus right now is a recent one that's been on the news a lot, climate change. So one thing to keep in mind is in my history class, I learned wildfires are actually maintained by many systems, uh, uh, ecosystems in the past and were used to help maintain a forest ecosystem. For example, the Native Americans oftentimes had tribal burnings to burn old vegetation, which would then supply nutrients to the soil and hence uh, improve the vegetative growth for next years. That is one of the greatest parts of wildfires. However, as everything is, if too much can hurt an ecosystem. When the global temperatures increased with the global warming, the wildfires became frequent. This is because the CO2 in the air ended up warming up because it was reflecting more heat. And after a system like greenhouse effect light, the overall temperature started to rise. This rise in temperature would allow for trees to start spontaneously burning more often. Um, human drivers can also cause many natural mechanisms like the global temperature to get thrown out of balance. This is seen in oceans and all over the country where the global temperature is needed to keep a system in homeostasis. Now, this is relating to positive feedback loops. As more CO2 enters the air, global warming becomes more prevalent. Now, as global warming um, becomes more prevalent, you'll see that uh, trees will start to burn even more, which will release even more CO2. If you actually look at the chart on the top right, you will see the daily CO2 emissions in California. And if you look at the red, that's showing how much higher it is in 2018 compared to 2003 and 2017. And this is even higher now in 2021 and 2022 and onward. On the bottom graph, you're going to see the increasing large wildfires in California. And it's on a positive trend. And in 2020, that bar was two times higher than in 2020, uh, 2010, showing the drastic increase. Moving on to more human causes for wildfires. Now this one shocked me quite a bit as I thought, okay, fires are quite common, you know, lightning would cause it and stuff. But if you look on the top left chart, it tells a different story. 95% of all California wildfires are human caused. Now this can be from power lines, reckless activity, or the one I'm gonna focus on, logging and industry. So anthropogenic causes happen directly or indirectly. This basically means that if you light a match and you don't forget to turn it off and put it out and you leave it in the forest, that's a direct burning cause. However, the most common ones that are actually the deadliest to catch are indirect ones. This is gonna lead me to my next point, which is logging. Now, if you look on the picture on the bottom left, logging is a huge industry and it does a very, uh, it does a very good job of supplying wood and hopefully renewing the resources. However, just like anything, it's messy. The simile I like to give with this one is, imagine you're cutting some wood to make your house. You got your piece all cut and you're using a saw. All the sawdust that comes out of that is laying on the ground. You just vacuum it. But in a forest, they just leave it there. And sawdust is extremely flammable. It's kindling for a wildfire. And all of this littered across the floor of the um, forest is gonna create a huge problem for wildfires spontaneously erupting. This is another example of positive feedback loops as well. Now, more and more land is now being repurposed for commercial uses because of the uh, overpopulating earth and how they're using it for tourism and housing. 
And as they're getting rid of the forest, trees that are more resilient to wildfires are being cut down, which lowers the uh, barrier for wildfires in forests and hence make them more vulnerable. Moving on to impacts. This is the one that I think everyone should pay attention to as this could affect everyone in the future. We'll start with biodiversity. So every species has their own ideal niche they live in. They choose one that has the particular temperature, the humidity, the foods, and so forth. That's why you find certain species of snakes only in Africa, while certain species of birds only are in Northern America. Now, the abundance of seedlings for lots of these vegetation to help re-sprout the new generation of trees in California are starting to disappear. This is because the wildfires are causing lots of uh, seedlings that were dropped in the ground to burn and evaporate, not evaporate, uh, just to get, go away from the ground. This is not allowing for new trees to regenerate and slowly lowering the barrier for more generations to come. Now, as wildfires become even more frequent, invasive species start to take effect. And I'll talk about this in a few slides, but homogeneous species that are now going to be going away, indigenous ones, are replaced by species from other countries that maybe are um, out competing them for food, sunlight, and water. And this is causing a major shift in the landscape. Now, soil is the growing auger on all of these plants, and it has lots of nutrients from potassium to nitrogen to phosphorus. When combustion takes place, say a wildfire, all of these solid elements of the ground become into a gaseous form and they go away from the soil and into the atmosphere. This creates the soil to be extremely dry and lacking in nutrients. Lots of plants, like oak trees, for example, cannot survive on that and end up dying off, therefore changing the species. If you look on the pictures on the right, there is the giant garter snake and the tricolored blackbird. These both species were in hundreds of thousands of population 50 years ago, but now they're both endangered because the habitat for where they live, specifically the northwestern part of California, is starting to disappear. Changing landscape over time. This is what I was getting out a little bit earlier. Many species are going extinct now because the fires are getting rid of their ideal living locations and replacing them with weeds like the horse weed that you see on the top right here. These weeds are taking over as they can allow to survive in very nutrient poor conditions and trees like the giant oak you see on the bottom need nutrients to survive and grow big. Now, a massive change in shrubbery like as you're seeing here causes a lot of genotypes to disappear. This is decreasing the genetic diversity in the forest. Now, if you do not have a strong genetic diversity in a group of population, any disease that comes through has a much larger effect. For example, if you had five different trees, each with a different genetic code, they would have five different possibilities of surviving a mass, massive traumatic event, say wildfire, hurricane, so forth. However, if you have all of them the same way, they might have, they all have the same genes and they all have the chance to disappear, therefore causing the vulnerability of the forest to go up tremendously. Now, oak trees was a specific species I studied as they were a huge contributor to photosynthesis. They took in incredible amounts of CO2 and released a lot of O2. Now, these trees were being burned off very quickly as they had a lot of carbon in them, which is one of the main fuel sources. Uh, because of this, it introduces this positive feedback loop idea again, as these trees are disappearing, more CO2 is not being absorbed by them anymore and are released in the atmosphere, hence global warming, hence more CO2 and so forth. Oak trees are one of the biggest species that California are trying to maintain as they're the ones that are going to keep all of the photosynthetic organisms at work. Now, wildfires are also causing the lengthening of seasons. As the temperatures are rising, the summertime and springtime where wildfires affect the most, including fall, are lengthening and allowing for even more devastation. Moving on to solutions. So these are just a little list of pollutions that companies are using nowadays to control how they can prevent wildfires. The first one is the better communication of risks. This is because a lot of neighboring communities around wild uh, forest areas are not aware that logging takes place nearby and hence are very shocked and cause mass devastation when wildfire-like events occur. Better training and modified practices is what I hit on with logging. If the government does legislation that helps create a tidier process for these industries, it will allow for less debris to fall on the floor and less chances for wildfires to take effect. Land management treatments are going to be more of designating certain land spots to non-logging procedures. For example, places with lots of oak trees, let's say we're going to keep them as a haven for it so that they do not 
actually get disrupted by any logging and allows for the photosynthesis to continue at higher rates. Now, this is a more of a long-term consideration, but thinking about how the current practices are affecting the environment now is the only way to prevent any mass events from happening in the future. If we talk about burning half the forest down or logging half the forest down for industry now, and we do not plan on regrowth and stuff, there's going to be mass devastation with lack of wood, which will devastate lots of industries, causing them to go bankrupt, which is a chain effect. As you can see on the bottom right, you have a photo of these fuel reduction treatment plants. A lot of times controlled burning is used to help get rid of some of this tinder. However, that is under controlled circumstances compared to um, uh, picture B here, where you see a lot of this uh, debris is left on the floor. This, might, this place is probably going to be wiped out by wildfire if nothing is done. However, there is hope as if you look in picture C, if properly treated, regrowth can occur at fast rates and allow for the forest to regenerate. So closing thoughts. These are the ones that I just want you to remember. And I know all of you are drawn to this photo at first. This is a photo of San Francisco's sky in 2020 after the fire. It looks almost like an alien invasion. It's orange because of all the ash and the elements that were released into the air from the fire. It was mass devastation. The forests of Western California were hit incredibly tough and the growing population is not making it any easier. Coupled with climate change, the drivers for wildfires are just causing mass devastation. And these positive feedback loops are amplifying the effects as each year goes on. If we can have more careful operations for industry and forest ecosystems could be better taken care of, we can allow for a better biodiversity richness as well as a wildfire containment for the next few years. And I think the big one I wanted to hit on is the new legislation. If the government can enact laws that say that industries have to clean up and that there are certain areas that they cannot be touched, we will allow for biodiversity to be preserved as well as species to continue living there for thousands of years and the forest can be brought back to their homeostasis state. Uh, these are my citations. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. That was awesome. Um, we have one question in the chat that says, do you think uh, contemporary ecological efforts can learn more from indigenous conservation practices? And if so, where do you think there might be room for intervention? Okay, so indigenous practices, I think of Native Americans and their tribal burnings and stuff. And contemporary ecological efforts could be using these techniques in controlled scenarios. For example, all these invasive species, if you find areas that have high density of these species, you could have controlled burning to help wipe them out and allow for the indigenous species to come back. However, as everything, if you do not control it properly and do not have the proper locations, it could end up harming the native species themselves. And the second part was uh, if you where might be room for intervention. This is about the controlled spaces. There needs to be designated plots of land that needs to be mapped out ahead of time that can analyze the species evenness and richness in each area, which will allow for controlled burning in certain circumstances. Awesome. So and then there's one more question. After a fire, how uh, what can we do to help an area regenerate quicker? Oftentimes, after fires wipe through an area, the soil is depleted of lots of nutrients. Now, I know it's tough to say using fertilizers, but oftentimes if we have introduced ammonia and nitrogen-rich fertilizers to this area, we can replenish the sources. We can also add other trees along, which itself will help regenerate trees at a faster rate. And the best way to do that is probably introducing species that used to live there and uh, their close relatives to allow for genotypes to spread and create a uh, forest back again. Great, thank you so much. Um, we did, I noticed we did have a question actually for Krish that we missed. Um, so Krish, if you're okay with answering one more question. Uh, it just said, where do you think uh, this research is taking you next and what kind of questions would you pursue further as an outgrowth of this project? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. Um, as I was doing research on this topic, I actually found a couple of interesting sources that uh, had some like relation with medicine. So I think that's one of the interest like topics that I want to look into as how like medicine related to the Roman Empire and then maybe even how the Roman Empire and like how it related to ancient Greece and that stuff. So that was like my next topic that I'm kind of interested in. Great, thank you. I think if anyone has any other questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, 
But otherwise, thank you to all our panelists. They were great uh, presentations. Thank you so much, everyone. I learned so much today. Okay, I'm gonna end this session. Have a good rest of your day, guys. Thank you.